All right, well, hey, friends, today we're going to be kicking off a brand new series about Joseph, and it's titled From Pit to Palace. You can find the account of Joseph in the book of Genesis, chapters 37 through 50. And I'm telling you what, it's an amazing story, just full of plot twists and scandal and betrayal and romance and power. And you can just see God's hand uh, over the whole thing. Uh, We're going to see Joseph go from a privileged son of Israel to a lowly slave of Egypt. His once very promising future turned bleak, and one day, it wasn't fair, it didn't seem right, but Joseph trusted God. He stood out as an exceptional young man. He he gained influence with his masters, and it looked like things were finally turning around when he was falsely accused and thrown in prison, forgotten for years, until one day, His God-given gift brought him before the Pharaoh of Egypt, and Joseph went on to save countless lives and became one of the most powerful men on the planet. Over the next few weeks, we're going to take a closer look at Joseph's journey from pit pit to palace, and uh, personally, I am so excited about this series. I believe that the Lord wants to encourage every single one of us to trust him in every season because he is working in every season. And just like Joseph, I want you to know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And I hope this story inspires you to embrace your God-given destiny. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis 37 today. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through our text, the first part of our story, and then just uh, make some practical observations. So Joseph at this point is 17 years old. He is the 11th of the 12 sons of Jacob. And out of all 12, he's daddy's favorite. He's the miracle son of Rachel, the golden boy. Uh, Daddy loved him the most. And and I'm just curious, uh, I wonder how many of you grew up with a favorite in the family? You know, you know the one who always got to sit in the front seat? You know, the the one who would take your toys and then you'd get punished? It was probably the youngest, at, at least for mom. You know, moms always favor the baby. It's the last one. You know, like you push mowed the grass for the privilege of living under their roof. The baby has a rider and gets paid 20 bucks. Like, I mean, what's up with that? But it's not always the baby. I, I was actually the favorite. And uh, I was not the baby, but I was the only boy. And you ask any of my sisters, and they'll tell you, I was dad's favorite. That was Joseph, and everybody knew it. Joseph got special treatment. The brothers would be out, out working, and Joseph was hanging at the house with Dad. You know, the brothers wore hand-me-downs, but Joseph, he got this fancy coat with all these colors and, and ornaments and sweet designs. You know, the brothers slept on the ground while Joseph had a king-size sleep number. Okay, I don't know about that last one, but you get my point. And, and I'm sure Simeon heard the phrase, why can't you be more like your brother on more than one occasion? And so you can just imagine uh, there was some resentment in the family about Joseph's special treatment. Genesis 37 in verse 4 says, When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. They hated Joseph and could not speak a kind word to him. And verse 5 tells us that Joseph had a dream. And you need to understand that this wasn't one of those like too much pizza before bed kind of dreams. Uh, We're actually going to see these dreams happen later on in the story in real life. The fact of the matter is that Joseph did have a gift And he was even able to interpret the dreams of others. We'll talk more about that in a couple weeks. But Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And you'll see why in a minute. He said to them in verse 6, he said, listen to this dream that I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine 
and bow down to it. How many of you have a younger sibling? Okay, just, just imagine that they come up to you and said, hey, guess what? I said, it's a really cool dream. It's from God. And, uh, and God says, that I'm going to rise up above you and, and like you're going to bow down to me. Pretty cool, right? Listen, I don't know how you'd respond. But in verse 8, Joseph's brother said to him, uh, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then in verse 9, he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. He says, listen, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Like, I'm not even his brother and this guy's getting on my nerves, right? When he told his father, as well as his brother, his, father's, his father rebuked him. And he said, will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Verse 11 says, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Verse 12, in the next few verses, we see the older brothers, they head out to work, uh, grazing the flocks. And Jacob sent Joseph to go out and check on them. So in verse 17, Joseph went after his brothers and he found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him, okay? You seem to underappreciate or appreciate that this has gone way beyond petty sibling annoyance, okay? They see him, and before he even arrived, they had a plan to take him out. In verse 19, they said, here comes that dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him and uh, yeah, then we'll see what comes of his dreams. I mean, these guys have clearly, they've had enough. They have no intentions of bowing before the chosen one. And so when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. The, let I remind you, richly ornamented robe he was wearing. And they took him and they threw him into the cistern. Now, the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. So here's Joseph in a pit, literally. Okay, we're going to see him in some figurative pits as well, but right now in this moment, he's in a literal pit in the desert with no water, probably injured, and, and I don't know this for sure. Okay, this is just me, but I'd bet money that his brother's peed in the pit. Okay, like I like, listen, I've got nothing scripturally to base that on, just what I know about brothers, as I play this scenario out in my head, that's just what happens. Like all 10, 10 of them are up there crossing streams and Joseph's just down, yeah, yeah. okay, maybe not. But, but regardless, he's in a pit, probably smells like urine, while his brothers are topside eating a meal and discussing their options. Ribbon, we see in verse 37, he was actually trying to figure out how he could save Joseph. Uh, he was ultimately unsuccessful, but Judah uh, did spare his life. We read in verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's, let's sell him to the Ishmael Knights and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. What a nice brother. I mean, like, why kill him when we can make some money on him, guys? And so they, they agreed. And when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. In verse 31, they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the robe in the blood, and then they took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, hey, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is, in fact, your son's robe. And in verse 33, the devastated father recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces 
And then Jacob tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth, and he mourned his son for many days. Verse 36 says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And we'll pick up uh, there next week. Uh, But basically, if you can appreciate Joseph woke up that morning the favorite son of his father's house. By the afternoon, his brothers had left him for dead in a literal pit. And by evening, he sold into the pit of slavery on his way to a foreign land. If you're taking notes, the title of today's message is What to Do on the Worst Day of Your Life. What to do on the worst day of your life. Now, we've all had bad days. Joseph has just had an exceptionally bad day. And uh, maybe you can relate. Maybe you're sitting here today and you've had the rug pulled out from under you. You know, you saw 2020 going one way. And, well, maybe you feel like you're in the pit right now at this moment. Maybe you're going through some relational strife with a friend or your spouse. You know, some of you find yourself in a financial pit. Just feels like there's no way out. Some of you have some major struggles at work right now. Man, it feels like there is no hope. Others of you are battling addiction, whether that be with drugs or alcohol or pornography. I know some are struggling with mental health issues. I don't know, maybe like Joseph, people who you trusted betrayed you. Whatever it is, if you're in a pit and you're struggling, I believe God wants to use Joseph's story to help you out of the pit. So let me give you four things to do when you find yourself in one of life's pit. Four things to do on the worst day of your life. Number one, admit that you're in a pit. Okay, you need to be honest with yourself. For Joseph, he was literally in a pit, okay? There there was no deny. He couldn't be like, yeah, hanging on the beach. You know, like, oh yeah, brother, doing great. Just... Filling up the barrel and living up the top, bless God. No, he was in the pit. And we don't like to admit it when we're in a pit because it's not fun. Smells like pee. We don't want to be there. Especially guys, we don't want to appear to be weak or helpless. So you know what I mean? We just put on this tough face and ask like, yeah, I got this. It's no big deal. Or sometimes, sometimes we just don't want to deal with our reality. We don't even want to think about it. So we just pretend that everything's fine. But you need to hear me today. Pride and denial are only going to dig you a deeper pit. If you want to see God's purpose in the pit, if you want to keep moving towards your palace, whatever that is for you, you've got to resist the urge to downplay it and just be like, yeah, no big deal. You know, hey, everybody has a ton of debt. Lots of guys cheat. Hey, we've all got our vices, right? I mean, nobody's marriage is perfect. No, listen. Listen to me, denying where you're at just keeps you in the pit longer. It might be hard, but you got to call it out and say, hey, this is not good. I need help. You may say, God, I need you. I love how the NLT records David's prayer in in Psalm 86 and verse verse 1. David says, bend down, O Lord. Now, come down in the pit. Hear my prayer. Answer me, for I need your help. Man, listen, God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Romans 8 says there's no height and there's no depth that can separate us from the love of God. Okay, there's no pit deep enough that can keep you from God's love. And you, listen, you've got a church family that loves you as well, a church family that will come alongside you and help you in your time of need. So just admit that you're in a pit. Number one, that's the first step. Number two, acknowledge your responsibility. Now, sometimes you do everything right and someone picks you up and throws you in a pit or or some outside force comes in and affects your situation and it's totally not your fault. I get that, that happens. But if we're honest, okay, most of the time we have at least some ownership of where we're at, right? Joseph was thrown into, into a pit ultimately because of his brother's jealousy, but even he had some responsibility. I mean, he definitely provoked his brother's anger. You're running out with his fancy coat to rub his dream in their face. Not a wise move. Genesis 37 and verse 8, we read it earlier. It says that they hated him all the more because of his dreams and what? 
and the way he talked about them, right? Like, I don't get the vibe that he approached them with humility and understanding. But I do believe that he learned from those mistakes. In fact, near the end of Joseph's story, he re-encounters his brother years later, and they end up bowing to him in the palace. And instead of lording his power and the fulfillment of his dreams over them, I mean, he treats them well, treats them kindly. And listen, if you want to avoid the pit that you're in in the future, you need to learn from it, okay? You need to acknowledge your responsibility or you'll just keep finding yourself right back in the same pit. If you just pretend like you had nothing to do it, do with it, if, if you deny it, if you're somebody that just blames everybody else, so it wasn't my fault, they did this and they shouldn't have done that, and she's, you'll probably just trigger the same events over and over again in your life except the people will have different names. You'll be working for a different boss. It'll be a different friend, a different spouse, a different church. You'll owe a different credit card company. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So important for us to take ownership of our part. Okay, don't beat yourself up and wallow in guilt. That's not what I'm talking about, and that's not healthy. But you do need to learn your lesson so you don't end up there again. Okay, so number one, admit that you're in a pit. Number two, acknowledge your responsibility. And number three, allow God to grow your character. Okay, before I unpack this, I want you to understand that God is going to bring you out of that pit. That's just what he does. He's going to be with you in whatever pit you find yourself in. Even if it's all your fault, he promises he won't leave you. He promises to work in all things for your good, but he does not promise that it will be quick and painless. The pit is never comfortable and convenient. And I hate to break it to you, but your time in the pit will probably last longer than you want it to. You know, Joseph didn't just have a bad day. He went straight from the bottom of the pit into slavery. Okay, even if you trust God, it doesn't mean that he's going to give you a quick fix. You might not get healed today. Your marriage may not be fully restored this week. You might not get that promotion this month. You might not marry your soulmate this year. But if you trust God in the pit, he will use your trials for good and he'll grow your character just like he did for Joseph. God will use the pain of the pit to make you a better person if you don't get bitter. In fact, I believe right now, even though times are tough, I believe that God is doing something in you so that he can do greater things through you. Like Joseph God may be using the pit to promote you. And I know you don't like the pit. But if you allow God to grow your character, you may end up looking back on this season and thanking God for the pit because of all that he accomplished in you, through you. I know that's been true for me. There was uh, one particularly very long, difficult season. I was trying. There was a lot of uncertainty circumstances weren't good. I went through actually right before we moved to Clinton to start this church. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it was a lot longer than I wanted it to be. It was a lot harder than I thought it would be. And uh, even though it was extremely painful at the time, I look back on that season and what I would call a pit with great fondness because I can now see hindsight, God's purpose, and his plan to not only grow my character, but to prepare me for a season of great harvest. I'm telling you, I wouldn't be the man that I am today if it weren't for that season in the pit. The problem is, can we all admit, we're just a pretty spoiled and entitled generation. I mean, we, we just are. We want what we want, and man, we want it now. Like, we're used to fast food and fast shipping and all of the information and entertainment and movies right at our fingertips. I mean, we don't like to wait for anything. And in my opinion, we have over-prioritized convenience and comfort. You know, those things are king. But can I tell you that God cares more about your character than he does about your comfort? I mean, you may care more about your comfort, but because God loves you and he wants what's best for you, he cares a lot more about your character. 
In fact, he wouldn't if, he, if his word didn't say this. In James 1 and verse 2, he says, Hey, brothers, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, that, that's, that's not comfy, but God's saying this is a good thing for you. Count it joy when you're in the pit because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Okay, perseverance is godly character. And that perseverance, he says, allow it to finish its work in you so that you, man of God, woman of God, would be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Kind of joy, don't get bitter, get better. Okay, you've got a choice. Okay, you can, you can like Joseph, trust God and hang on to his promises and believe in the fulfillment of that dream and God will use the pit to make you better or you can get bitter and hard-hearted and angry of God, at God and miss out on what he has for you. Okay, remember, embrace God's purpose in the pit and he will bring you out. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17 says that our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Okay, the pit that you're in, the season that you're in, it's not gonna last forever. And really in the grand scope of things, it's not as bad as it seems. Okay, our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them all and will last forever. So what do you do on the worst day of your life? Well, you admit that you're in a pit. You acknowledge your own responsibility. You allow God to grow your character. And number four, you always trust God. Always. You know, one of the lessons that Joseph's story teaches us is that if we trust God, we'll eventually see victory. What Satan meant for evil, God will redeem for good. Something you may not know about Joseph is that 1,500 years into the future, Jesus, the Son of God, would eventually be born out of Joseph's family. God had a plan to use this messed up family to bring the Savior into the world. And Satan tried everything he could to mess up that plan and tear this family apart. But God wouldn't allow that to happen. Check out Proverbs 19 and verse 21. It says, many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose. Come on, say the Lord's purpose. It's the Lord's purpose that prevails. You know, we make all kinds of plans and our spiritual enemy, he makes plans, but it's God's purpose that prevails. So trust him. Man, even when you can't see it, even when you can't feel it, man, you can trust God and you can know that what he says in Romans 8, 28 is true, that he is working in all things for your good. You know, I believe that's why God gives us stories like Joseph so we can see that truth play out over a lifetime. Listen, no matter what pit you find yourself in, God is working. Okay, you can trust in that. In fact, towards the end of Joseph's story, in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And over the next few weeks, we're gonna see God redeem Joseph again and again and again from life's pit. And my prayer for you is that hope would well up inside of your heart that God is weaving together your comeback story. And some of you, I just feel like I need to remind you today that your story is not over. Okay, you may be in the pit right now, but that's not the end of your story. You guys think, I don't know if you've ever <clears throat> watched a movie on Netflix. I'm assuming you probably all have. But if you pause that movie somewhere in there at whatever scene that you choose to, all of a sudden, depending on what device you're watching, on the bottom of the screen, you can see like every scene. You can, you can see the whole movie. You, you pause this and you kind of zoom out and you can see the beginning and the end. And some of you need, you're, you're in a pit, but you need to realize that you're just, this is just one scene of the movie. This is just one part of your story. This is, this is not the end. And, and, and in, probably all the movies I like, there, there's always this moment 
where the hero of the story, you know, whether that's Jason Bourne or, you know, James Bond or Jack Bauer, you take any action, good flick, you got, there's this moment where it looks like it's impossible. There's no way he's going to beat these guys. He's dead. It's over. Oh man, good try. But the story, you know, there's always that moment, right? But, but if you zoom out, if you pause it, you look, you can see the end of the movie uh, where, where everybody lives happy for, happily ever after, and they save the day, and they're cruising off into the sunset, okay? Because, you know, the writers of the stories aren't going to leave it in the pit on that scene. And I think we need to remember as Christians that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith, that the end of the story is already written. I've read it. We win. Okay, and so right now you may be in a pit, but it's just, it's just one scene of the movie, and you can trust the author of your story. Okay, you can trust that he's not going to leave you there, that he has a plan for your future to pro- prosper you, to give you hope, that he has good things, that, that his promises stand true, and you need to trust him. Always, always, always trust him. God, even when you can't see that he's working, he is working. You know, as I was, as I was just hanging out in the story this week, I, I've never had thought about it this way, but I was, I was just saying that I, I put myself in Joseph's shoes where in one chapter, at the beginning of the chapter, he has this vision where he's lifted up above his brothers and they're all bowing to him. And it's from the Lord, and this is this is dream that he has. And before the chapter is over, I just all of a sudden saw from his perspective at the bottom of the pit, where instead of being elevated above his brothers, he was down well below looking up at all of them. And in that moment, if we just zoom on that moment, it can seem like, oh, we missed it. Uh, God... What God said, I guess I didn't hear him right. I guess it's not going to come out. But Joseph's story wasn't over yet. And neither is yours. And you can trust him. So what do you do when you're in the pit on the worst day of your life? Number one, admit that you're in a pit. Okay? Don't let pride get in the way of you getting out of the pit. Okay? Don't, don't let pride and denial uh, keep God from doing what he wants to do in and through you in the pit. Acknowledge your responsibility. Okay? Repent. Ask forgiveness. Make things right. I mean, learn from your mistakes. Allow God to grow your character. Man, it's just exciting that even in the hardest seasons of life that God is doing sometimes the most profound things in us to make us better. Don't get bitter. And number four, always, always, always trust God. And Lord, we just thank you for being uh, so trustworthy. God, so faithful. God, for generations you've come through for your people. And God, we can see it. A snapshot of Joseph's life, even in the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, that you were working for his good, that you were weaving a story together, that you were going to use that uh, for his benefit and your benefit and to save uh, the lives of many. And God, would this story just build our faith? And God, would you speak to every heart watching right now? Uh, God, that you, just like Joseph, God, you've got a plan and a purpose for them. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that over these next few weeks, God, that our faith would be built, God, that hope would rise in our hearts, and God, that we would be the people and the church that you've called us to be. In Jesus' precious name, as you keep praying, if you're here today, you're watching, and you don't have a personal relationship with God, You're dealing with guilt over sin that you've committed. Maybe you're watching and, you know, I talk about the future glory, heaven and all things. Maybe you don't know where you're going to spend eternity. But let me tell you, you can know today, okay? You don't have to wait on your salvation, you can know the moment that you call on God and you accept the gift of his grace and his love for you and you put your trust in him, man, you can know in this moment that I am a child of God, that my sins are forgiven, that he has made me new and there's a promise for me in heaven 
waiting for me that God wants. You can know that right now, here in this moment. I believe for some of you, uh, this is going to be that moment for you. And I just want you to know how much God loves you. So much so that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to come into this world, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for your sins. He did that because of how much he loves you. And he's so powerful and he's so able that Jesus, even though he was in the tomb, his story wasn't over. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He's alive today. And if you call on his name, you could be saved. And so I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Just call on him. Say, Jesus, I want to know right now that I am yours. That I am saved. That my sins are forgiven. Jesus, I'm calling out on you. Would you make yourself real to me? Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. God, let this be a turning point in my life. God, today I surrender myself to you. Make me new. God, use me for your kingdom and your glory. In your precious name I pray, amen.